The exhibition Renaissance to Revolution covers 300 years of French drawings selected from the collection of the National Gallery of Art. We have a collection of over 900 drawings from that period and we've chosen 130 for the exhibition. There are many relationships between the drawings that are in this exhibition and the other works of art in the gallery's collection. Not just the painting collection, which includes works by Boucher, by Watteau, by Fragonard, the same artists whose drawings are represented in this, in this exhibition, um, but also in terms of, say, books. Many of the book illuminations or drawings that we have for book illustrations uh, in the 18th century especially, we actually owned the illustrated book as well. Drawings are not just to be seen all by themselves. They do occupy a place within the, uh, the entire hierarchy of the arts. The wonderful thing about drawings is that for the most part, they're intimate, they're small. You can walk right up to them in a way that often you can't walk up to a painting. When you go through an exhibition like this, you see that there's incredible variety in how every artist approaches a subject. The very first drawing in the exhibition is uh, this wonderful uh, illustration, biblical illustration of the story of uh, the coronation of Solomon. It's by an artist whose name is not very well known now, though he was a court painter to Anne of Brittany, the Queen of France. His name is Jean Poyer. He was a miniaturist. He was involved in uh, making very uh, beautiful, richly ornamented books for the royal court. This drawing represents very clearly the deep roots that French draftsmanship has in the medieval traditions of book illumination. Much of the development of French draftsmanship um, and art in general is associated with the various monarchs who reigned at a particular time. In the 16th century, for example, Francois Premier, Francis I, uh, who ruled from 1517 to 15, the 1540s, um, was very important in uh, the shaping of artistic style and, in fact, an entire new school of French art. He invited artists from Italy, Leonardo da Vinci, the most notably, but also uh, Luca Penny, who studied with Giulio Romano and Raphael, and Benvenuto Cellini, a uh, great sculptor from Florence. And then the French artists who worked in their studios uh, absorbed the lessons and took the stylistic uh, lessons, the formal lessons, and even the, the techniques that these artists used, and transformed it into, into a style and a type that became uniquely French. Uh, but the, the Italian-French relationship is one that continues through the years, through the three centuries that's represented in, uh, in this exhibition. In France, because of the medieval tradition of book illustration and uh, manuscript illumination that is the basis of draftsmanship, there is also a tradition of drawing standing alone, standing as the final work of art in themselves. Uh, this is not so true in Italy, so it's, it's a particularly French thing, and it continues also well into well, the 18th century and beyond. In terms of the kind of drawings in France that were intended to stand alone as the final work in themselves, there's a long tradition of portraiture. It starts in the 1520s, continues well into the 17th century. Uh, this is a particularly beautiful example by Francois Quenel, made in the 1590s, um, and represents the importance of the facial features uh, that are drawn with exquisite precision and here porcelain delicacy. This kind of drawing would have been kept in albums. Courtiers would have collected portraits of their friends, uh, people that they met, people they didn't know, or portraits of the king, and would keep them in albums and would perhaps leave through them, show people uh, whom they had met. 17th century in, in French art is known mainly for a shift from the mannerism that, that sprang up at the court of Francois Premier and uh, the tradition that was very much focused at the court uh, in the 17th century becomes a very classical uh, structured form of art that uh, refers back to the Renaissance and antiquity. Uh, it's a kind of reaction to the uh, ebullient mannerism of the previous century. Uh, the court becomes less a focal point for the first part of the 17th century uh, the reign of uh, Henry IV and Louis the, the 13th. 
the relationship with Italy is one that continues very strongly in the 17th century. Many of the French artists travel to Italy. There are several who actually pretty much spend their entire career in Italy, including Nicolas Poussin, who is one of the great history painters of uh, French 17th century, and Claude Lorraine, who uh, is the great landscapist, and shaped, in fact, the form of landscape for the next couple of centuries. He drew from nature. He would travel out into the landscape, and he would take his drawing supplies, and he would travel, and he would draw from life. But he wasn't a plein air painter. He wasn't painting in the landscape. He would take his drawings back to his studio, and then he would compose from the elements that he had studied in real life. He would compose a kind of perfect, uh, classical, structured, um, new Arcadian landscape uh, that was a more perfect expression of nature than nature itself. In the second half of the 17th century, uh, art becomes centralized in France at the court of Louis XIV, the, uh, the Sun King. And he has one artist, uh, Charles Le Brun, who basically becomes the czar for all art at the court, not just at Versailles, but also in, in the Louvre, in the French palaces. Uh, he runs the Gobelin Tapestry Factory. He has his finger in every uh, single aspect of the artistic pie, celebrating the feats of the mind, the successes, political uh, especially. For example, this drawing, uh, which is unusually large, was made for, uh, in preparation for a print the, of the, exactly the same scale that was going to celebrate a victory uh, that uh, Louis XIV's troops had uh, in, in eastern France, what, what is now is eastern France, in an area called the Franche-Comté. Uh, they conquered several towns in the east and expanded the French borders. And the king wanted to celebrate these feats and memorialize them in a series of prints. Color is an omnipresent element of uh, French draftsmanship. It starts, again, back in the miniature, miniaturist tradition, with, uh, which was full-color miniature painting. Um, and different types of media uh, were used that added different kinds of color to the drawings over the centuries. Watercolor, of course, uh, pen and ink, which could be brown ink or black ink, white heightening, which added the lights, uh, red chalk and black chalk, which in the beginning were natural chalks literally dug out of the earth, uh, red ochre and uh, just black charcoal. Also, artists could use colored papers. Sometimes they're blue, uh, they're actually manufactured blue papers. Uh, sometimes they're, they're gray-brown. Sometimes the artist would prepare the paper as Claude Lorraine did for his landscape. Uh, one of the most wonderful combinations in French draftsmanship is one called trois crayons in French, literally three chalks, which combined red chalk, black chalk, and white chalk, usually on a gray-brown paper, but sometimes on blue. The example I'm standing next to is by Antoine Watteau, who is, is regarded uh, as the great master of the trois crayon technique. He's working at the beginning of the 18th century. He did not invent the trois crayon technique. It had been used in Italy as early as the 16th century and continued in France in the 17th century, but he is regarded as the great quintessential master of uh, this wonderful combination of the red, the black, and the white chalks. What is very beautiful is the way he uses, combines the three chalks, not simply the red for the flesh, or for the color of a dress, um, or the white for a highlight, or the black just for an accent. He uses them uh, in a, a kind of symbiotic relationship where each one uh, performs the task of color, of contour, of light, of shade, surface, and altogether he creates incredible effects.